Hello and welcome to season two of the Don't Give a Ruck podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Parker, as always. And today I was joined by Cardiff Blues and Wales back grower Shane Lewis Hughes, who opened up on his rise from injuries to becoming a fully fledged Welsh international. Firstly, though, Shane began by telling me how he has dealt with the pandemic over the last year and how he has kept himself in tip top shape. Enjoy. No, oh, good mate. Like you said, obviously, COVID's um, took us all by a storm, hasn't it? So, mm. you know, especially if, um, with the, the amount of deaths that has happened through 2020, and obviously it's creeped into this year as well, hasn't it? So it hasn't, mm. like, it's just gone away. Um, but no, thankful to be back in, into sport now. Like, we, mm. we returned, uh, when was it, August, I think it was. We played mm. the first two games. Um so it was just good to be back in a routine. And I think it took everybody by, by surprise um, that was playing, really. We thought when the season came to an end back in last last March, was it? Mm. Yeah, last yeah. March. Um, it took everyone by surprise, but everyone thought it was just going to be, you know, maximum a month. Nobody <laughs> expected what was going to happen mm. when it was months down the line. So, yeah, um, I was quite um, fortunate, really, to to get on top of it and I sorted myself out a little gym and, and what have you so I didn't go absolutely still crazy in, in, in the meantime and able to, to run and do bits and bobs but yeah just really grateful to be back now playing So what was the gym like is it like uh, Rocky 4 like with like all snow and you're like you're doing pull-ups on, on wooden bars <laughs> It's not our old school but you know what it's, it's funny because my mother's uh, actually got a shop in Ferndale mm. and um I was and I saw one of the boys was saying to me, So how, how are you gonna do it then? Are you gonna how are you gonna set up this gym? I said, Well, my mother's got a spare room in the back of the back of the shop. <laughs> so I said, All I'm gonna do all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask her if I can set it up back there. Mm. So luckily enough that um CrossFit initiate um this in Ton Pentra and the Lomba, they got uh, in touch um, saying that they were renting equipment out. So I just got on top of it. So I went straight to them, rented a lot of stuff, yeah. shoved it in the room, and <laughs> I made the most of it basically. But it turned out quite. It turned out. It turned out quite well. It turned out really well. And yeah. me and my brother were me and my brother were up there all the time. So it was good. They're like I was so fortunate to have it because I know loads of the boys didn't have any equipment. Mm-hmm. Um, during that time and I wouldn't have known what I would have done if I couldn't have done a gym for that length yeah. of time um, I know we'd like running and stuff but yeah not being able to have weights or anything like that mm-hmm. would have been an absolute nightmare yeah yeah, so, it's crazy though um, like you, you know I, I've spoken to Win Jones I think I spoke to Win Jones last year and he's got his farm so he, he can use his farm and you know it's not like footballers where you know they can just go down to their local centre and all be together is it you know you've had to do your own work over the last few months haven't you yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you know, the last couple of months you've had to do your, like you said, do your own work, mm. do your own weights, and you know, it was quite tricky. Now, even returning back with COVID, it's um, it's sort of like you, you know, you're in your own little groups, going into weights, you know, all in one room together. But it's you know, still a massive thing now, uh, wearing masks when you're not uh, mm. training and playing, and um, yeah, it's it's been a lot lot different since returning mm. to to rugby now. Mm. But what was it like the first time? Because I think I think we spoke about just now. You had two games. I think you played the Ospreys down at Rodney Parade last year. I think it was August right. time or or something yeah. like that. Because you had that long sort of break from March uh, up to about August, and then you had two games, and then there was another massive break before the internationals. What was that like? Yeah, like so, mate. Like sometimes. Like, even though I love rugby and, mm. you know, it's something I'm so grateful to do as a professional. Like, it's, it's amazing. Um, but sometimes you can get on top of it week after week after week mm. playing high-intense games. And when it came, it was sort of like for a lot of boys, it was like, God, it's nice to have this, you know, this little break um, for the first three or four weeks. And then after that, you're like, right, come on, now it's got to be returning soon, hopefully by the sixth mm. week, right? seven week, eight week, and then it just goes like twelve weeks, you're like, God. Yeah. Like we just can't wait to return to to play rugby again. And mm. sort of gives you a perspective really how lucky you are to do what you do. Yeah. Um and like, I've always realised that anyway, but it puts even more of an emphasis on it. How lucky you are to to play rugby and you realise how much you you miss it. Uh, the worst worst thing I, I find is I know you went to Colligate Camoyth and you played rugby there. 
my cousin is currently playing with color, well, playing or training at calling it Camoid. And he said, you know, some boys are actually not turning up, you know, and they're sort of right. falling out of love with the game because they haven't played, obviously, at junior level and obviously at premiership level yeah. and below. People are falling out of love, love with the game, isn't I, they? Yeah, that, that's, that's a massive point, that I was going to hopefully come on to that in a minute. It was, I feel so sorry for the youngsters now, especially at that age, junior level. Um, I know up by me is, is um, a lot of coaches are playing hell with it, that they need the community game to get back up and running because from a mental health point of view and just the joy that it brings to so many youngsters, mm. you know, to play the game of rugby, it's almost like an escape for them. You know, yeah. that Tuesday afternoon at five or six o'clock or whatever it may be, mm. this session where they can go play with their mates and, and that's what brings them joy. And mm. it's just really good and that's how rugby grows through stuff like that. Um, so I, can, I, I can't imagine how difficult it is. Mm. Um, as I know for five, if I was that age and someone took rugby away from me, how how upset and mm. heartbroken I'd be by that. So it must be so difficult. But I'm hoping that sooner rather than later they can get back to doing it. But I just hope we don't lose too many youngsters in the meantime. Mm. Yeah. Um, falling out of love with the game of rugby. And, and I understand um, it's really difficult at the minute because they're thinking, well... I'm not able to play, I'm not able to do this. So what's the point then? Mm. It, it must be a really hard thing to do at the minute, but mm. I just hope too many, there's not too many people that actually think that way and when rugby can't return to the community that um, throw back into it. Mm. And it's a good segue into grassroots rugby and talk about where you came from. And I've seen a few articles about you where, you know, you're saying that you're rugby obsessed, you know, and you always want to get better and better and better. Where did it begin for you? Um, so I started playing rugby when I was six. I started playing rugby when I was seven years old, I think it was. Yeah, seven. Um, for Ferndale RFC. Um, and that's where, like, that's where I first fell in love with the game, really. Mm. That's, yeah. Um, and it, it all started. I remember I was watching. I was watching uh, at the time. I didn't have a clue what it was. So I was watching a sport on TV. <laughs> I was like, I think it was like six or five, and it was uh, Island View Wales mm. um, or Wales Island. <laughs> and um, I remember asking my mother. I said, like, what was what's that on the telly? I was just transfixed by what was going on. Mm. And uh, she said, Oh, it's it's rugby. Wales are playing. Wales are playing Island and. Um, she could see I was like really like fixed I couldn't get my eyes off the TV yeah. and she actually said to me at the end of it she said um, there's a club up the road um, who will play rugby and it was Ferndale RFC and um, I remember my grandfather bought me my first pair of boots and then on the following Thursday um, he took me for my first session and mm. that's where then I just absolutely loved it. Couldn't mm. stop thinking about rugby, playing rugby, and it was just absolutely amazing. Mm. Constantly then in school, picking up like a pair. <laughs> I remember I made like a pair of like, uh, my pair of like gloves into a rugby ball and you're just playing in the in the yard <laughs> and I'm just obsessed with it, absolutely obsessed yeah. with it. And I just loved it. And from there then really just grew just the love for, for the mm. game. Mm. And I suppose... You know, I think if you speak to anyone, whether they form out a lug for rugby, they'll always remember their first rugby training session. Because, yeah. you know, a lot of people, like I started when I was seven at my local club for Redvelin, and it was touch rugby then. So for some reason in my head, I'd watch some American football thing where you put the ball between your legs and just swing it between your legs and throw it. And I just chucked it between my legs and the boy, boy's about to pick it up and just hits him in the nose, gives him a bleeding yeah. nose. And that was my first memory of, of rugby. So... It didn't start out too well for me. Obviously, it started out better for you. But um, I, I saw somewhere that also you went to watch the Cardiff Blues when you were younger. Yeah, I used to go down with my um, my grandfather, actually. He used to take me and my, my younger brother down um, quite often down at the Cardiff City Stadium. And obviously, he's back playing there now, funny yeah. enough. But <laughs> I, I remember when we, we went down and we used to watch um, the Blues play at the time. And, you know, the likes of Mark Williams, Xavier Rush and... And all these Sam was coming through as well at the time, and you know all these big names, and we just absolutely loved going down. We couldn't wait for like a Friday or a Saturday, whatever it was, to, to go and watch go and watch the Blues uh, the Blues play. And mm. yeah, when the Blues played Ospreys or the Scarlets, like the games we really really looked forward to. So mm. 
no, it was um, it was really exciting for me and my brother back then watching them mm. play. And I, I, well, I'm not sure if, if if he was the coach, but Dai Young might have been the coach when you went to watch him as a youngster. Is it strange now yeah. having him as your head coach and it's all come full circle? Yeah, it's mad, it's mad, isn't it? When you think of it like that, oh, I haven't really thought of it like that. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> um, it's mental. Like, you know, he was there when the Cardiff Blues were in their prime with Xavier Rush and Matt Williams, you know, and like I said, Sam coming through the half penny, Tom James, all these mm. boys. Um, he was coaching then. And then for me to come through now and die to return to the club is, uh, mm. is really exciting. And I'm really looking forward to being coached by him and, and see what he can do for, for me and, and, and the rest of the team, really. So it's exciting times. Mm. And have you managed to have a chat with Dai or is he, have you done any team meetings? Yeah, yeah, briefly. Um, briefly had a chat with him. Um, he's a really good bloke and um, he, sta- you know, he stamps his authority down and you know exactly what, what, what he wants and he's all about winning. And, you know, that's something that, with the team, sorry, with the squad we got, that's, that's, that's the mindset we got is, you know, we should be winning um, a lot more games and um, that's his mentality as well. So hopefully that makes a nice, um, makes a nice little balance in our, in our squad where he comes in and, and gives us that confidence really to, to win more games. Mm. And I found this in football as well. Um, I don't know whether the crowds make a difference or not, but it seems like some sides who were maybe doing well prior to the, the lockdown have maybe dipped in form. And then some teams who, you know, maybe were a bit inconsistent, you know, the Blues had a fairly inconsistent season last season, but now it's starting to pick up again. And, you know, there's almost like an identity there now. So you look back now at when you were younger and you looked at the likes of Warby, Nugget and, and Javier Rush, you, you're creating your own little back row for the future and there now with uh, with James Botham and, and yourself, aren't you? Yeah, like, mate, the amount of boys we've got coming through now is mm. unbelievable. It's just getting higher and higher and higher and everyone is everyone is good enough to play. You know, that's mm. the crazy thing. It's not, yeah. it's not where you're like, where you think, well, he's good, but he's a little bit under. Like, everyone is more or less now that's coming through is at the same level. I think I made a joke mm. the other day, I said, fly off used to be the position everyone wanted to play, but now everybody yeah. wants to play in the back row. Yeah, and like, it's crazy. <laughs> it is, it's just the thing, everybody wants to play in the back row, whether it's six, seven or eight. Everybody wants to, wants to be there. And, you know, I think, if you think, look at the amount of back row as Wales have produced over the years, you know, Martin Williams, Sam Warburton, all the Toby Falter, T- Tipperick, like all these amazing rugby players, Martin Williams. Mm. It's absolutely unbelievable. So mm. you can understand why people want to play in that position mm. and just the nature that it presents the way, what it demands of you playing that position. It's, um, it's brilliant. So when you're coming through and you're playing with these boys, you have to be at the top of your game because you know you're so easy replaced because there's so mm. much quality, especially, especially with us at the Blues. Like, there's so many good back rowers. You can put anyone else there and they'll do a job. So yeah. we're quite fortunate in that, in that, in that respect. And, and it pushes us, as, pushes us on as well. So when you are selected to play, you know you've got to be at the top of your game. Otherwise, you could not be playing the following week. Mm, exactly. And a lot of the players that have come through, they gain their experience in the Premiership. Obviously, you've gained experience in the Premiership with, with Pont de Pri. I think Cardiff and Merthyr, you've also had stints at as well. Um, yep. What did the Premiership do for you? And is it a, is it a good sort of league for, for youngsters coming through to learn their trade? Yeah, it is. I, t- I tell you what, when I was at Ponty, I absolutely loved it there. Like, that's mm. the most, in terms of just pure enjoyment, you know, relaxing a little bit. Mm. I think sometimes you can overthink stuff in the game of rugby, especially, you know, as I've been lucky to make my way up, you can sort of overthink stuff. But um, you sort of have the confidence just to express yourself a little bit more because um, you've come through the age grade, the academies, you've had the best coaching. Um, so you just go up there and try and express yourself, really. And mm. I, I loved. It. I think I was there for a year and a half, and I really loved my stint there at Ponty and the Justin Bedell. And you know, he, he uh, sort of gave me the confidence, really, just to go up there mm. and express myself every every time we played. So, and I played with some great players, Rich Shellard, um, mm. loads of these boys, Ponty legends. So um, it was absolutely brilliant. There, it was good, good for my development as well. Learned a lot mm. and. 
you need those stages. You need to have, I believe, is massive. I think sometimes, you know, when you come through the age grade and some boys, they go from 16s and then straight from 16s, they don't even do 18s. They just go straight yeah. into the senior game. And I think yeah. sometimes that can either work really well or it can go really bad. Yeah. But I think you get picked up too much. And then you sort of believe the hype that everyone creates around you. And then that's when it falls. But I believe, you know, a nice transition from 16s, mm-hmm. 18s, 20s into Premiership. And then Swan gives you a bit of a humble humble background and keeps you mm-hmm. well grounded rather than mm-hmm. shooting straight from 16s to to regional rugby or whatever it is. It's, um, it sort of grounds you. So you've got a nice little stepping stones yeah. rather than um, setting up for a massive disappointment. Mm. And and, to, and talking of stepping stones, that the college rugby has only really took off in the last ten years, I would say, mm-hmm. and I think it's trying to follow the model in in New Zealand. Obviously, as as we talked about earlier, you played at college, come on. What sort of standard is that at? Because you know, you look through the years, you know, Jared Evans, Dylan Lewis. I remember Jared Evans playing against Dan Jones against uh, and Cigar, and J- Josh Adams was on the wing for Cigar as well. So yeah. it, it shows that the the system's working, doesn't it? Oh, 100%. Um, I actually haven't watched it over the last year or two, but I remember when when I was there, it was it was the biggest thing, playing college rugby. Mm, um, yeah. It was so, so intense, the games. Um, I remember my first year, I absolutely loved uh, mm. playing with... Um, uh, who, who was it? I played with Kira, Kira Zorati, uh, mm. Kevin Foreman. It, like, it was loads of boys I played with at the time. Um, mm. We had a hell of a team. Absolutely. Cameron Lewis, was Cameron Lewis? Cameron yeah. yeah. Cam, uh, Cam was there. Um, there was a couple of us, um, Corey Tarrant. There was loads of boys um, that done really well my age for the Blues 18s then. So, um, yeah, being part of that system with under Clive Jones, Lee Davis and, and Kat, mm-hmm. um, it was really good for my development. And Clive is someone I have a massive respect for anyway in the game. And he really took my game to... To the next level, really. Um, and he's a kind of block who is always going to make you aware of how you can do better in the game. Yeah. You know, he's never going to, you know, push you, like, knock your confidence and, and keep you down. But he's always someone that's going to make you aware that you can improve on certain elements. And, mm. and that's what you need, really, to keep pushing on because it's, you don't want somebody blowing smoke up your ass 24 7 when you want to, you want to get better as a player, especially at that early age. It's massive. From 18 mm. to whatever it is, those early ages, you need to. That's when you need really need to be progressing. And Clive did that for me, and I really enjoyed my time in college for the two two years I was playing that. Yeah, and it almost seems like a bit of a whirlwind because you know I remember watching you for Ponty, and and then all of a sudden you're, you're playing for the Blues, and then you have a few good games, a run of games for the Blues in the back row, and then you, you called up to the Welsh squad to to play against Scotland. As it seemed like a bit of a whirlwind for you, you know where. You know, it's, it's taken about six or seven years in that progress from college rugby, premiership rugby to Blues and now Wales. But does it all seem it's happened all at once? Yeah, do you know what? Funny enough, I was saying the other day, actually, that I had, I think it was from when I left college to go into the, because when I was in college, I was with the uh, Blues Academy yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, but from there, when I first went into the senior um, environment under Danny Wilson I just I couldn't escape like little injuries yeah. so when I was playing for Ponty I was still picking up injuries while um, it, while playing for the, the Blues or, or training with the Cardiff Blues I mm. like that transition into senior rugby was a big step up for me really um, and I was picking up all these little niggles and little setbacks here and here and and I, I just couldn't catch a break for ages. Um, you know, I made my debut uh, for the Blues when I was 19. Um, quite early, like my first my first year, I made my debut for the Blues off the bench uh, in, in the Pro 14 against Scarlet. And I thought, oh, this is brilliant. You know, things are happening. The things are happening really good because all the way through age grade, I always played a year up and... Mm. Everything was going brilliant, and then I done that with the with the blues. I thought, oh, this is just going to keep going up and up and up and up and up. And then from there, that's when I really struggled. That's that. That's when the injury sort of 
took over and there was like a pulled hamstring here, a pulled mm. calf. And I was just picking up all these little injuries and God, I was like, God, I can't catch a break. Um, and then I really struggled there with my knees mm. um, while playing for Ponty and um, just training for the training with the Blues every day. Mm. Um, it got to a year, I think it was 2017, my last year with the 20s. Um, that's when I started to have these like problems with my knees and mm. like uh, ten really bad tendonitis and I uh, was at the end of the uh, season then coming into uh, two thousand and yeah I think it was January two thousand eighteen then I was forced to have two knee operations mm. um, and during that time from when I made my debut uh, for the Blues to have my knee operations I didn't have a single game in the Pro 14 for the Blues mm. after that so it was really hard and I thought God I might never actually push on to you know to do what I want to do and, and you sort of think God is my knees going to set me back am I actually going to have to knock it on the head and am I actually never going to push through am I, am I just going to play in the Premiership and all these was, sort of was you, was, sorry was, was you close to retiring then or was it just a, a thought in your head it, it, like it was, it came, it came to a point where I had such bad tendonitis I couldn't even walk down the stairs tidy. Bloody hell! Like I, I, I physically after games, I haven't really told anyone um, this, but after games, I used to be so bad that I'd have to like sit on my bum and like, <laughs> like literally bounce myself down the steps. Yeah. Um, and I used to put this like tape around my knees and tie back so tight just for the tendonitis to stop it and mm. I got myself in a really really bad place and you know I was lucky to to go have my knees done out in Sweden by an amazing amazing knee surgeon um, in Sweden um, and he literally was a lifesaver because yeah. now I'm able to do more than I was before my knees you know, mm. touch wood yeah. <laughs> I haven't had any, I've had any problem since yeah, and it's really, I believe that is the massive reason why I'm able now to to push. I have, I've been able, sorry, to push on and and play regional rugby because mm. I'm not going in the games worrying about my knees. I'm confident. I feel strong, and mm. I know from that point where I thought I'm never going to be able to play rugby again because they were that bad. Um, to the point where I am now, it's just, it's just absolutely crazy, and it has been a whirlwind. You know, from that point after the knee operations, I was able to break through um, with the Blues. Then um, it took me a bit longer than I wanted to, mm. but I'm quite glad, in a way, that I went through that period because it's made me appreciate made me more it. grateful. Yeah, and it's made me appreciate it a lot more because I never thought I would be at this point now the way I was feeling back then. Mm. Um, like I said, I always had a brilliant transition through rugby or through age grade, always played a year up, done this, done that. And I always thought it would continue smoothly like that. But then as life teaches you, you know, nothing ever goes to plan and there's always mm. going to be bumps in the road, but it's how you, it's how you ride the wave, the wave sometimes. And, you know, I, like, I look back at it now and I'm glad I went through that because like you said, mm. it's, it's made me grateful for, for where I am now. Mm. And, um, yeah, yeah, like I said, it has been a whirlwind since I've started playing for the Blues and, you know, to luckily break through with the Blues and um, and put some consistent games together and play and play quite well for the Blues. And, yeah, it's just been unbelievable, mate. And, you know, to break mm. into the World well squad, it's just it all happened so fast, even though yeah. it wasn't fast, if that makes, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, well, I think um, you were in... You, yeah. you were in... You were in the... Um, the Welsh camp, I think, for the, the Barbarians game in the December, I believe. And then I think they sort of kept in touch with you, even though you weren't officially picked in the squad, you were still picked in the in the camps. And then all of a sudden, I think there was a few injuries prior to the Scotland game. And then all of a sudden, you're you're picked in the squad and then you're named in the in the starting 15. That must have been incredible. It, it, was, a bit, it was a bit of a mad one, mate. Like, it was, it was crazy because I remember we played... Uh, first two uh, games in the Pro 14 that mm. that season it was against Zebra and Connacht and you know, I played rather well like mm. it went quite well for me the first two games mm. um, and um, I was I remember I was really disappointed not that you expect to get picked for Wales of course but you mm. sport, you sort of put that expectation on yourself to mm. you know to play well so you eventually 
push on for higher honours and mm-hmm. you know that's what I expected of myself to, to try and get into that squad and I remember when the squad was initially announced and I wasn't in I was really disappointed with it um, mm-hmm. and it took it quite quite hard but I sort of thought right I can't do anything about it I just got to keep going keep going keep riding with the, with the punches and I'm unsure why I should be in the in the squad um, but then I remember I had a phone call then on the Sunday um and we played Connacht the day before. Mm. I had a, f- a phone call off uh, Martin Williams saying there was a couple of injuries in, in the back row. Uh, I was called up for training that week. Um, and then I thought, OK, I'll just be you know, in the squad training and what have you. Like, great experience, brilliant. You know, I was just glad to be um, ev- eventually called in. I remember I got through that week of training, really loved it. And then <laughs> the next week then just hit me by complete surprise because I had no inkling like no yeah. sort of like sometimes you get a bit of a clue you were whispers mm. and, and stuff but literally we had a team meeting um because it was after the boys played France um and then we had Scotland that week and then we was in the team meeting and Pivak said boys is the team for this week um yeah. and if we could put our hands together for Shane Lewis who was making his debut this week and I was literally I was sat next to, to Foxy and you yeah. could see like like, oh, was that was that a surprise? I was like, yeah, because like my face was just like, I, I I literally I didn't know what was going on. I thought I was like in a dream. I was like, yeah. this, this, he made a mistake. He's like, you, you meant to say someone else's name. Like this is not. Like, I had no inkling, like nothing before. But he came up to me afterwards and he, he said, oh, I want. I didn't want to tell you because I wanted it to be special. Mm. Um, <laughs> I, I remember I got to my room man, and I phoned my mother and my uh, girlfriend. And I just burst into tears. Yeah, I just told them like what was happening, and I'd be playing Scotland that that week, and mm. they were just over the moon. Yeah, and uh, I, 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 was, I I couldn't believe it. I literally couldn't believe what was happening. I remember being so nervous that, mm. as well as excited that week in training because you didn't want to mess anything up and you wanted to get it all spot on. Yeah. All these thoughts going through your head. You know, I've been waiting for this my whole life, kind of thing, and. And then you're telling yourself, like, don't overthink it. It's just rugby. You are representing Wales. It's crazy yeah. emotions that go through your head. You mm. just go up and down, up and down all week. But, um, mm. yeah, and the boy said to me, I was just asking some of the senior boys like, for advice and what they were like on the, uh, their first game. And they just said, look, just try and take it all in. It goes by mm. so fast. And I remember uh, Halfpenny telling me that, that it just goes by so quick, just make the most of it mm. and like enjoy every minute. He said, because one minute you'll be singing the anthem, you'll blink and you'll be in the change rooms, getting yeah. presented your car. Mm. Um, and, it, and it literally did feel like that. Mm. It literally felt like I sang the anthem and I just was back in the change rooms, getting presented my car by, um, by mm. Anna Wynn. And it was just, it was just crazy, but it was like probably one of the best days of my life. Yeah. And, and well, Looking back at that game, obviously, as a Welsh supporter, we were very disappointed with the result. But it was promising to see, you know, a guy making his debut like yourself and putting the amount of tackles. It looked like the nerves turned to excitement straight away and you were absolutely everywhere. Did it feel like that? And did it go like that straight through to the, the final whistle? Was it really quick? Do you know what? I remember being so nervous the day of the game that my legs felt about a hundred stone. Like literally my yeah. legs were like lead. I was sweating. Mm. Um <laughs> ringing my mother, ringing my girlfriend, saying how nervous <laughs> I was. I couldn't like it was mental, it just came like that. Um mm. by the morning it really hit me like a ton of bricks. But I remember singing the anthem, thank God I'm gonna be sick. Mm. And I just literally just before kick off, I thought, right. I got nothing to lose. Just give it absolutely everything. He's, I thought I, I convinced myself if it's ever a game to end yourself in, to give absolutely every ounce of yourself mm. is this game. Mm. Um, I remember just being so revved up by kickoff just to play. Yeah, I was just right. Just get into absolute everything. Do everything you possibly can. Um, by the end of the game, I was absolutely exhausted I <laughs> couldn't yeah. move mm. um, yeah and you know it did it went quite well for me you know my debut um, mm. obviously things you can I can improve on and I wanted to do it I looked at and I could have done better but um, yeah it was amazing you know to play mm. that game and uh, to do it on the day Alan win um, yeah. the record as well was, was quite special for me um, mm. and obviously to be present my cap by him as well was amazing so 
like I said, mate, it's a day I'll, I'll never forget. Mm. And, and a lot of people, well, a lot of the internationals I've spoken to have, have talked about their first cap, just like you. It all, it all sounds the same, the excitement and the nerves all coming at once. But then they always said, you know, it's not about the first cap, it's about the second cap as well and the third. And you do want to be a one cap wonder, do you? And then I, th- no, I think, I think your, your third cap was against England. You started against England alongside James Botham and Falatau in the back row and you come up against you know, a back row that's been tipped uh, to tro- tour with the Lions this year in Underhill, Curry and, and Vulapola. What was that like? Yeah, it was, like you said, with the, after the Scotland game, I was like, right, I won my first cap, but I yeah. didn't want to be a one cap one. Mm. And that's the thing I dreaded. I was like, oh, please let me get, <laughs> please let me get picked for the next game, even if it's on the bench. Like, please yeah. let me just get picked. And so that came and that was nice and... Then it was like, well, I don't want to be a second cap wonder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to get picked against England and mm-hmm. you know, to play against a back row like that is the ultimate test, really, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So yeah, um, and they're amazing, you know. And there'd be no doubt if they are selected to to start in the back row, you know, for mm-hmm. for Lions because they're incredible at the minute. You know, Tom mm-hmm. Curry, incredible Sam and Drill, Billy Vinopola. Um, Don't be wrong, we got incredible back rowers ourselves. So you could pick anyone, but yeah, it was a it was a great test for me, and and I know it was for Jim as well to to play to play against a, a back row of that caliber, and it only mm. makes you better when you learn from their experiences, whether it be good or bad. So yeah, it was great, mate. And and looking ahead to the Six Nations, I believe the the squad gets picked this week, I believe, and the Ireland games in in three weeks' time. Um, do, do you know when? Well, let's say you do get picked. Do you know when training starts or? I, do you know what I mean? I haven't got a clue. I haven't heard anything. Mm. Um, I haven't heard absolutely anything about when it's announced. I couldn't even I couldn't tell you when it's announced. Um, I'm do you still do you still get the nerves? Oh God, I I get them. Um, yeah. That's one thing I wish I could be better at is controlling nerves mm. and I want to stop being nervous because nerves are a good thing. But the yes. way sometimes they can over Take, take me like mm. I can get so nervous that I'm like physically wanting to be sick yeah um, that's not a bad thing mate because you know you, you look at Neil Jenkins he was sick for every game yeah yeah I know I know some players are really some players are worse than me where they are physically literally being sick they're puking yeah. just before running out the tunnel mm. you know I haven't got to that level yet but yeah. I think it's, it's just one of them things it doesn't matter who, who I play for I've been like in my whole life I remember mm. I remember I remember a semi I remember we played Astro vs. Rubina, right, in a semi final of the <laughs> Cup and the 13s. And it meant so much to me that I was so, so nervous that game because mm. I didn't want to lose. And the thought of losing made me physically sick. So going into yeah. that game, you know, most, so probably most boys are just there to just enjoy it. And mm. don't get me wrong, I did enjoy it. But like winning is like such a big thing in my head. Mm. But at that age, I was so, so competitive. I couldn't stand the thought of losing. I hate yeah. that more than anything. Um, but yeah, that was... I remember that game. I felt so, so nervous. Yeah. And it's been like every game since. Like, I get yeah. so nervous for games. But then when I'm in it, I absolutely love it. Yeah. But the, the, blue, <laughs> the, blue, the Blues Cup was actually a really big competition, wasn't it? Because yeah, yeah I... I, I Played under 14s and we were in the semi finals against um, St. Joseph's in Cardiff. And Jared's, Jared Evans is our fly half, and they'd hammered us like 50 points. And we were a really good team. We had the likes of Dylan Lewis and, and Garen Smith playing for us as well. And um, Jared had a penalty to win the game, and it was literally near, near enough in front of the post. And he's missed kicked it, but he still went over. But it was almost like in between the bar like the, the, the right bar, and it sort of went like that, but it clearly went oh, over. Brilliant. Our linesman put his flag up and their linesman put it, left his flag down. The referee went like that. No, nah, didn't go over. And like everybody was in tears after the game. But that's what the Blues Cup was like when you were younger, wasn't it? It was like the biggest competition you could enter into. Oh, God, I'm going to remind him of that because he'd still be yeah. tampering with that. Today, you know, <laughs> yeah. which is the oh, tell him to say St. Joseph's under 14 semi final. You'll know, you'll know what you're talking yeah. about. Um, yeah, but no. One thing we haven't touched on is, is the lack of crowds in the stadiums. It must have been a great day for you making your debut against Scotland, but I don't think you would have imagined it being empty and in Clareley. 
Oh, do you know what? I, I said that at the time. Like, the she you told me when I was a little kid that you know I'd be <laughs> my dad one day, and I won't be in front of you know seventy five thousand people in the Prince Party Stadium, mm. or the Millennium at the time. Mm. I'd be like, and I might couldn't have my family there or my girlfriend. They'd be like, what? Yeah, what are you, what are you talking about? Yeah, you know. But then for it to happen and nobody's there watching. Far from the coaches and and, yeah. the, and the sub and the, and the traveling reserves, it's a bit of a weird one. But um, I suppose that you know, if I am lucky enough to to play again for Wales, hopefully there will there will be crowds there, and hopefully I get mm. to have my family and, and my girlfriend there, and I'll count that then as as my first cap really to proper soak it in and have them there and them. Um, watch it you know if I'm ever so lucky to like I said to get the chance to play for Wales again mm. but yeah it is a weird one mate not having not having crowds there, especially that day I made my debut mm. it was it was really weird you're just singing the anthem looking into the stands yeah. and it's just no it's just nobody there like but did, 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 bird did, sitting on the posts <laughs> <laughs> did, did you feel like it. you could belt out the national anthem or were you were you a bit like oh I don't want to yeah, sound the, too much on the telly yeah, the boy, the boys could hear their own, uh, hear their own uh, voice. <laughs> there. That was a bit awkward. But um, we got some boys that, that absolutely blast, blast it when they sing the national anthem. Anyway, so you can sort of like bell down your voice, so it sort of hides in between some of the boys' voices. So yeah, um, no, you're still singing proud. And finally, before you go, Shane, is it okay if we finish with a quick fire round? Yeah, of course. Brilliant. Right, who's the best player you played with? Best player I've played with. Right, can I answer this in a, one yeah, of the forwards yeah. from the backs? From the backs is Jared Evans. He's yeah. the best. I've never seen a rugby brain like it. It's absolutely mm. unbelievable what he does. Like, you can tear teams apart just by himself. So, in from the backs. Um, and then from the forwards, then. Oh, God, this is tough. Like, I hate saying it because I hate blowing smoke up his ass anyway. But Belcher is, yeah, yeah. probably William yeah. Belcher. Um, yeah. And it sort of winds me up how much he, did, he doesn't get enough credit for yeah. what he does. He's an incredible mm. player. Like, he's, mm. he's one of them players. He's one of those hockers that can do absolutely everything. Mm. His darts are unbelievable. He's like, attack, his rugby brain, his defense, everything. Mm. He's like, he's, he is the ultimate. The, the ultimate talker. So them two, them two were the best they've played with. Yeah. Well, well firstly on Belcher, I remember when I was at Pont de Preview, Simon Bayliss was our coach, and uh, yeah. I think we tried to get Belcher because I'm not sure if he was a Triorki at the time when he was younger, but um, we tried to get him to because we knew he was coming to Pont de anyway, and he had to chat to Dale McIntosh. Simon did about having him play for the youth at 17, and Dale McIntosh said that nah, he's too good for youth rugby even now. Like put him straight into the pond pre yeah, team, he broke, which they did. He broke, yeah, he broke him quite early, didn't he? If he yeah. was like seventeen and he made his debut yeah. on his stick set. Another one with Jared is that I remember playing against Jared when I was eight or nine and playing with him, and he does that dummy, and you know he's going to come, but he still manages to pull it off. Mate, even in training, right? He does it, and you know he's coming. Yeah, but you know, you know, you're not going to be able to stop it. You yeah. can't get a finger on him. <laughs> And he's just like, oh, you knew it was coming, but you know yeah. exactly. It was one of them things where someone has to come that way, someone has to go the other way to trap him. And even then, yeah. he probably still there through. I don't know. I generally don't know how he does it. Well, but yeah, then to respect, like with Belch, I remember, I remember, I remember going to um, my first Romber under 15 session. I was 13 at the time. And Chris asked me, Chris Jones asked me to, um, to go train with the boys. And like for, at 13, like that's, that's at the time, that was a big thing to do. Like, step up with the under 15s in the in the Derby Shield year. And I remember I came to training and I remember the first person I ran at was Belcher. And he had this <laughs> pad. And I ran at him and I was 13 at the time, 10 stones soaking wet. <laughs> and I ran at him and he absolutely sent me flying. He put me up in the air, up in my ass. And I was like, Chris, come on, this is not fair. And he was like, oh, come on, boy, you've got to run harder. <laughs> I was like, Chris... <laughs> He's like he's twice the size of me. He's absolutely killing me. But yeah, yeah, I just been watching Belcher from there, and then all his transition into rugby. And at seventeen, he played for Ponty, and mm. yeah, he's just he's an incredible player. Mm. Well, he could get picked in the Welsh squad. You never know. He's going to run a games now, isn't he? Yeah, I think he deserves to. Uh, mm. 
Uh, right. Secondly, that, that was a long. I, I should really change the name of this quick fire thing. That was. A, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not quick. When it's, I'm no, to it's not. Uh, uh, the best play you've come up against. Sam and Dale. Sam and Dale. Uh, best friend in rugby. That I play with now is yeah, I play yeah. Liam Belcher. Liam Belcher. Uh, favorite coach. Uh, Chris Jones. Uh, biggest wind-up merger that you've played with. Yeah, Belcher. <laughs> God. Three up with his hat trick for him. Uh, best match you've been involved in? Uh, winning the Grand Slam in 2016. Uh, Wales, Italy. That one. Yeah, definitely. Did you, did you hammer England away in that? Yeah, yeah, we did. That was another good end. Um, but it was just for everything that, you know, it was the last game, you know, potentially playing for the Grand Slam, the occasion. Yeah. And how amazing it was after it. Yeah. That, is, I could name so many, but but that that, that sticks out to me. Like, yeah. Uh, worst drinker you've played with? Liam Belcher. <laughs> no, he's actually he's actually he's actually good. I tell you, mate, it is. If it was still was the worst drinker, you know, I'd nominate myself. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> um, the worst drinker, I'd say, Jared Evans. He doesn't drink though, does he? No, I did. no, say that. No, I take that back. I'll eat someone else. I'll eat someone else. I'll sip of vodka and he's sleeping all night. Is he? Yeah. It'd be a cheap night anyway if you're drinking with him. Yeah, uh, exactly. Biggest, biggest troublemaker on and off the field? Lewis Jones. He's a little bugger. Oh, oh he's Nick, a little Nick, bugger. Nick, Nick Williams said that. Yeah, honestly, he's an absolute, he's a joker on the field. I remember, I remember um, the boys, I think he was playing for Cardiff RFC and they were against, uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure who it was against. It might have been Murphy or someone. And they were in the scrum. <laughs> and he said to someone, he said, come on, boy, you've got to go push out, are you like a slug and jam? <laughs> I was just absolutely, I was just absolutely crying the way he said it. <laughs> and he comes out with his jokes all the time on the field and you're, you're trying to concentrate on the game but he's so funny he's brilliant typical you know, scrum <laughs> yeah exactly, exactly. Uh, and finally Shane if you weren't a rugby player what would have been your dream job um, like I've always been into it would be something to do with sport um, mm. I've always said I, with my best mate I've always wanted to own my own gym and mm. go into business with him uh, my mate Thomas Jervins I've always said, like, one day, eventually, we get to do our together, have our own gym mm. back in Bromba somewhere and, and set that up and, mm. yeah, have our own little business for something after rugby. Um, but I've always said, if I didn't play rugby, I would have liked to be a swimmer as well, so probably a swimmer. Yeah. Bloody hell, that was, that, was, that was out of the blue. Swimmer. Yeah, no, I, 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 used to, I used to do swimming. When I was younger, I used to do swimming for Bromba Sharks. Mm. Um, and I used to do that uh, from, I think it was eight or nine till I was about 11, 12. Mm. Um, and then from there, really, it was a choice of, because rugby back then with me was quite demanding with Romba schools mm. and stuff. So it was like twice a week, play on a Saturday and mm. playing the, the school as well. So, and, and swimming takes up so much time and mm. it's so consuming of your day and what have you. Yeah. So I had to make a choice, really, which one I wanted to do when I chose rugby. But I really, really loved swimming as well. So it was a tough one. Yeah. Well, well Shane, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show, mate. And uh, all the best and best wishes for uh, the Welsh squad announcement in the week. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, catch up soon. Awesome, mate. Thank you. Appreciate your time. All the best. Yeah.